Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon to everyone. Uh, morning in the uh, Central European time and afternoon, I guess, in the Philippine time. <laughs> so my name is La Vie Marquez, and um, today I am going to present to you a thesis of mine. Um, recently, I graduated in uh, advanced masters in cultural anthropology and development studies here in K. Leuven in Belgium. And um, my thesis turned a uh, presentation for this conference is called in the re slash on making or marking Batuk or Philippine traditional tattoos in the diaspora. So perhaps many of you may have observed that um, the emergence of uh, Philippine traditional tattoos among Filipinos and also among foreigners have increased uh, more and more in the last two decades. But I would not like to focus on the setting of the Philippines, but rather on the outside, the global re-emergence of these revival or re-emergence. <clears throat> and also I will not focus on just to set expectations of the meanings of tattoos, but rather what tattoos do rather than mean. Okay, so um, this tattoo, just to give a background, um, why did I choose this uh, study or this project? So I was, uh, I had this tattoo, the one that you are seeing on your screens on my right side, and I had it a couple of years ago. And this one is a symbol of duality, <clears throat> duality of beings, but also a unity of of two entities. So it's a um, man and woman, heavenly and worldly. And um, this is, I guess, a metaphorical project to mirror this, uh, this tattoo, which is to unify or harmon harmonize the fragmented aspects of my psyche, my bodily existence, I guess brought about by the colonization. <clears throat> of course, the social and cultural milieu I found myself in, and an attempt to understand these fragmented aspects also of history of being a Filipino. Um, right, and to, it is essential to note uh, from this time on that the background would be um, Filipino-American relations, hence also uh, we can touch on the American colonization, which started in 1898 until 1942, so about 30 something years. And um, if, as many of you know, that this occupation was largely, they used the strategy of ideological colonialism. And um, many authors, such as I would mention, uh, Hocano, Rafael, Ileto, Aguilar Jr., De Leon Jr., and Mendoza, highlight the proliferation of uh, Americanized or rather also Europeanized versions of American history, of, of Philippine history. So I guess they're biased and um, this paved the way for the creation of everything white or everything American as um, <clears throat> the protector, the friend, the dream or the land of possibilities. Um, I would like to mention a quote from Mendoza. She said, there seems to be a tighter transnational link that binds Filipino nationals and their Filipino American diaspora counterparts in the United States. Um, why is that? I guess because neo colonialism or neo colonialism, I'd rather say, is at the rubric of both realities in the Philippines and in the Filipino American society. They are situated in parallel, very parallel, but also distinct geographical, social cultural and political conditions, which is also another one of the background of this um, presentation. Again, as mentioned earlier, I would like to focus on what the tattoos do rather than mean. So the agency, the agentic role of, um, of tattoos. Of course, the meanings are very important, but it lacks the navigation, it lacks the space for navigation of being in the world and the uh, um, inspired by Sorda's notion of being in the world, and rather it evades coolness. 
and why the diaspora? Uh, it's more a practical reason also. So because at this time of the pandemic, it's quite hard to, to visit um, places and do field work. So the, the diaspora com community is the one that I was able to reach uh, and they are willing to communicate with me to do this research. So I'm very thankful for the community that I was able to, to um, be in contact with. So again, this presentation unravels how Batuganet's inscriptions on the bodies of a diaspora community specifically, specifically called um, the Tatak ng Apat ng Alam or Mark of the Four Waves. So it exerts a surfacing of um, intention agency by considering them as continuous strategy. This is going to be the outline, this is the background of Batuk in the Philippines, the background of Batuk in the United States, and going more into the uh, engagement of Tatak ng Apat na Alam or the Philippine American Diasporic Organization in the US, um, who are likely the pioneers of revival movement of Batuk or Philippine traditional tattoos. So <clears throat> in the making. So um, tattoos in the Philippines uh, have been already in practice since the pre-colonial period. Um, and it is mostly associated with uh, head hunting. So when you cut the head you, of your enemy and then you bring it home. So this is like a symbol of your, of your bravery. And when to mark that bravery for a long time, you get a tattoo and uh, you celebrate this cutting of the head or the, the, um, the winning, the victorious of the person who cut the head. And so it was um, associated with hand hunting and Scott um, considered it as modern military decorations because it also incites fear among the enemies when you have these red or black tattoos. So it became, um, you know, making the enemies uh, scared. <laughs> not only that, it's not only associated with head hunting, but also with uh, beauty. So the more you have it, the more beautiful, uh, the more handsome you are. <clears throat> and also the more privilege you have or social status you have in the community. And it means also um, greater affluence. So the, the meaning you are able to pay for these tattoos. And another thing for fertility, they said you are more fertile for birth. You are also, um, you have the higher chances of getting a marriage or getting a proposal marriage. Um, another thing, it's related also to spirituality. So they say that it eases the passage from life to death, from death to afterlife. Also, there are different techniques. So we have to know that uh, it doesn't only exist in the Northern Philippines, but also in Visayas and Mindanao, okay? Because most of us know that the, it's only in Kalinga, but there are other parts in the Northern Luzon, other parts in Visayas, and many groups also in Mindanao that practice these um, uh, tattoo culture. And there are different techniques, hence there are different techniques. So there's hand tapping, uh, when you insert a bamboo and then you tap, insert a thorn into the bamboo, you dip it into the charcoal with water and then you tap it into the skin. So it becomes etched, the, the ink becomes etched on your skin and that becomes the tattoo as a result. Um, yes, there's also hand poking. <clears throat> it's a little bit the same, but the, the, the technique is different. So you poke it instead of tap it. The last one is the incision. So it's a, you do this thing. <laughs> You incise rather than tap or poke. Okay. Um, right. Okay. So in these kinds of narratives, um, as you can notice, that there became a hegemony of uh, tattoo narratives and tattooed bodies. And so <clears throat> uh, we have to be uh, careful about this. Because, for example, according to research, Krutak and uh, another author, they write, they assert that headhunting wasn't as regular or as widespread as many had stressed. And so 
it uh, perpetuates the colonial images and narrative because these pictures were taken, some pictures were taken during American colonization <clears throat> with this primitive um, notion, primitive narrative. And so we get stuck to it because of the proliferation of these images in uh, books and essays and t-shirts and other uh, uh, icon items. And so we have to be responsible in showing these to people because it might, it has a danger to, to repeat again what the history has done to the Filipinos. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> in relation to that, there were significances of tattoos. So before it was like for um, <clears throat> to enhance your image, uh, more for the positive, but during the US colonialism, it became very negative. It became a taboo to the point that um, the discourse on savagery became um, the cause for boundaries and binaries. You have the non-Christianized versus Christianized, lowlands versus highlands, native versus civilized. It became a shame, a source of shame for people. So they cover their tattoos <clears throat> and it became um, a sin for people to have these kind of tattoos or to do this practice. Okay, more and more since because of the shifting significances, the revive the practice became uh, decreasing and decreasing and it denoted a decline. But over the years, it also became a source of resistance. Um, during the World War II, you know, the warriors came and uh, fought the Japanese, the, the headhunters with their tattoos, they fought the Japanese as soldiers and killed them. Also some women uh, after the colonial era, they, um, they removed their clothes and protested against the Chico River Dam project, the construction of the Chico Dam project after in about 1974. And so this became the, the, the beginning of the fusion of, of, um, of styles for tattoos, which I would like to elaborate later. So even if denoted a decline in the last two decades, as I mentioned earlier, it became, um, it caught attention again for Filipinos and also for those outside the Philippines. Okay, just a little bit background on the um, but migration, but look in of migration of Filipinos to the US. So they said it started in the 1500s in Morro Bay, California, but then the um, colonial occupation was really the boom of migration of Filipinos to the United States. So you have the Pension Act of uh, 1903. So the scholars, the sons, of, the sons and daughters of elites went to the US, they studied there, went back to the Philippines and um, legitimized the colonial uh, bureaucracy. There was also the um, labor uh, in sugar and pineapple plantations in 1906. When they started the migrant labor, it increased and increased. Um, also, Filipinos were migrated as soldiers, so they came to the Philipp to the U.S. And uh, also, eventual institu institutionalization of overseas employment, uh, international marriages, and ease of family re uh, reunification. So, as of now, um, American soil is home to the largest number of. Filipino American diaspora. Quickly. Okay, let's go to the community that is the focus of this research. It's called the Pakna Apatna Island or Mark of the Four Waves. And um, <clears throat> they are based in California, but their origins can be traced also to the resurrection of the uh, Polynesian revival movement. So they were inspired by this movement um, because of the similarities, the Pan Pacific relations to the Philippines also, uh, the similarities in tattoos and designs and in names of the designs. And uh, these are some of the numbers, as you can see in the upper right, there's a, a, a photo with a symbol of the Tatak ng Apat na Alam, or four waves. And this name was derived from migration wave theory, which also has many um, critics among Filipino historians and anthropologists, but I would not like to delve so much into that. 
And so they believe from this migration wave, wave theory that Filipinos began with Negritos or the dark-skinned um, Malayo-Polynesians. And then the third is the Indians and Arabs. And then the fourth wave is the Spanish invasion. So this name, according to Mark of the Four Waves, it was a strategy to resist the fifth wave of migration, which is the American colonization. So it's also, they call themselves the urban warriors. And so this is their way to embrace or situate their multiple identities, their sense of belonging and to reclaim the, the, the repressed memory of language and cultural traditions. And uh, within many, many years of existence, now they have up to 400 members all over the world. And the pendulum-like conditions of uh, and participations also of this Filipino diaspora community or in silence words, the transcendent dimensions trigger the great wave to Takna Apat na Alan would uh, impact in expanding the discussion from, and also the engagement of tattoos <clears throat> from singularity to hybridity, from meaning to agency. So now I would like to discuss the different engagements of these community. Um, Okay, these are some of the pictures of Joseph, <clears throat> one of the interlocutors. And uh, again, as I mentioned, are, I consider them as a system of action also based on the analysis of my interaction with the, um, with the group. Okay, the first, first engagement is knowledge production. So this quote we collected to educate them uh, was from L in an interview. And um, they are not headhunters, uh, literally, but they are headhunters in a way because they are they are educating people about historical and cultural um, determination. And so it's not only a tattoo studio that they have; they also have like a museum, a library, you have Philippine artifacts, they have material culture there. And um, in this way, people get to learn uh, through visiting the studio, through visiting the shop of the, the Philippine history and the Philippine culture. Aside from material culture, also the conversations that they have with members, with non-members. Um, they also attend university lectures, tattoo conventions, photo exhibits, also arts and culture festivals, and they participate in these uh, sites to teach and also to, to learn. <clears throat> also, they use uh, social media. It's very important nowadays to disseminate information. So aside from showing their, their uh, projects, tattoos among their clients, they also put the information there, where is it from, what does it mean, et cetera. And so in this way, body itself acts as a knowledge production site. And it tells people the links to not only tattoos, but also pottery, weaving, basketry, and sculpture as the designs are quite similar from each other. Okay, second one, it is um, <clears throat> another engagement that they have is um, decolonization. It is a big project to tackle, yes, but I believe that um, this engagement is very much present in the way that the organization deals or um, engages with Batuk. So for example, there's uh, one member, which is Mel, <clears throat> and he engages with, um, with tattoos he has a lecture called No History, No Self, No History, No Self. So N-O and K-N-O-W. So this lecture is to educate Filipinos and also non-Filipinos about the limiting narratives of being a Filipino. So he just deconstructs <clears throat> the limitations, the, the colonial narratives that was perpetuated before. <clears throat> and so it is important for the members not only to return to the culture, but also to liberate the, the ideas that we have before. And in this way, the tattoos become a decolonizing tool um, in our battle, in the continuing battle to the colonial, of the colonial past. Um, and so this suggests that the members, that the um, borders for members to cross is not really geographic, but cultural and historical. But preserving these tattoos is not wedged in the same context. It doesn't mean it's the same thing. Why is that? Uh, now we go to the third engagement, hybridity or dehybridity also, dehybridization. 
And again, uh, uh, this quote is from one of the members, one no, non-members, Louis Piper, he's also a tattoo practitioner and um, a researcher in Mindanao, who practices tattoos in Mindanao. Last one, hybridity. This quote is from Al again, to really, he, he told me, to really tell the story is to actually evolve these tattoos. So what does this mean? It just means that they mix the tattoos to have a new way of interpreting these tattoos and um, they infuse their own, uh, they recreate this, their own um, interpretations of tattoos. Fusions of old and new, different styles, different techniques all over the world. And also their own approaches to have this questionnaire answered by members uh, who are interested to get a tattoo. And so uh, it only means that they are not stuck in the same old way of doing the tattoos. So it's not defined by cultural purity, but a process of adaptation and hybridization. And in this way, our engagements of tattoos, of selves and society, our identifications to our body, to ourselves is destined to migrate, in the words also of Stuart Hall. Okay, and in this sense, uh, just an afterthought, all of these making, remaking, there is also um, an underlying um, truth to it, which is unmaking. So we have to be prepared to uh, let go or to release what we know in order to understand these kinds of engagements, especially the changes happening are happening every day. Okay. So that will be all for my presentation. It's a bit fast, but uh, I hope you learned one thing or two. And in case not, uh, something comes up and something is not clear, I'll be happy to answer your questions. Maraming salamat po.